So I went to NAMM last month with some friends of mine from the music industry. Shout outs to Noah Stewart and Aton Agencies for letting me tag along and see all the cool toys. And we saw the guitar and amp and effects manufacturers with the pro audio manufacturers have been up to and well let's just say I got distracted and I didn't get as much video as I should have but just look at these lights. I mean these lights are awesome, right? And I scored an awesome set of these blue strings. Now, normally I would say to myself, self, you don't need blue strings. The regular ones are just fine. They're, they're, they're just fine. Um, but we were at NAMM and, well, you know, toys! So I've got a gig coming up this weekend and my sparkle caster needs a new set of strings. So I'm going to change them out and I'm also going to fix the action on my B string because it's a little too low and it's buzzing a little bit. And I hate that. And then the strings will be blue. To do this quickly, I've got all my tools together. I've got, of course, the strings. Um, I've also got the string winder, which is all you really need, but I like this one with the clippers. That makes everything easier. Um, and then I also have the other things that I'm going to need. Um, this guitar is also filthy. It's been a minute since it's had a bath, so I'm going to give it a quick scrub-a-dub with some guitar polish. And, you know, kudos to Ernie Ball for this guitar polish. They made it... Uh, the cheapest one in the shop and this bottle has lasted me forever and as a broke-ass grad student I very much appreciate that. Sponsorship. And if you want to really do the job right, you got one of these little tripod things that holds up the neck and doesn't let it fall over. A couple things as we're getting started. I'm just taking the tension off of all of the strings and then I'm going to snip the strings both at the nut and at the bridge. This is mostly because I just don't want the strings flying around and scratching anything. And I also took them all off at once just because I also wanted to clean underneath them. You could do them one at a time if you want. It really doesn't make a difference. But the more I was thinking about these strings, the more it was not the actual act of changing the strings, but it was the strings themselves that I wanted to talk about. Because if I learned anything at NAMM, it's that my assumption about the plain strings being just fine, well, it isn't untrue, but it also kind of misses the point. Visuals matter a lot. The main stage at NAMM was a playground for gear nerds. It had all the lights, it had all the scaffolding to hold the lights, the mixing booth was the size of many festival stages itself. There were jumbotrons everywhere. They had cameras on booms that swung over the stage to get close-ups of the artists, and a camera crew to catch everything else. They had the sound isolating things they put around the drummer, and they even had a disco ball that they dropped just for the final song of Earth, Wind, and Fire set. They had toys upon toys upon toys. It really was a great show. In his essay, Audiovision, French composer and filmmaker Michel Chion proposed an audiovisual contract between the sights and sounds of film and the spectator perceiving them. The perceived motion of a sound used in cinema, Chion proposes, can link together mismatched visual frames chronologically order sequences of images, or even trick the brain into thinking that still pictures are moving. It can also change one's perception of the passing of time. The eye, Xion continues, takes in information at a different rate than the ear, so if you hear something in constant motion, you'll think you see it as well. He uses the example of the opening sequence of Ingmar Bergman's Persona, where the sound of a projector running links the sequence of images as objects in motion rather than the still frames that they are. Sound focuses attention, and it can also distract the eye from what's really happening in front of it. As you may notice, we've already finished changing the strings, and what took me a good 10 minutes to do passed in a matter of seconds, mostly because you were listening to me speak as well. Live performances are different, aren't they? Well, perhaps. But modern concerts aren't just a direct connection between a performer and a listener. There are in fact many layers of tech between a musical idea and the ear that it's intended for. Mediations, if you will. Be nice to your sound engineer, folks. You'll regret it if you don't. While the medium was different, 
how we as audience members perceived what was happening was still determined by all the mediating forces at work. We didn't just see Earth, Wind, and Fire play. <laughs> we saw Earth, Wind, and Fire play. Uh, but we also saw the efforts of a small army of professionals determining how we saw Earth, Wind, and Fire play. But so what? Why do we care about all this spectacle and whether it's visual or auditory or what? For this last bit, we're going to have to get a wee bit into Marxist political theory, okay? Not trying to make y'all communist communism, but like economic systems drive everything and we're living under neoliberal late capitalism, so you probably should understand some parts of Marxist critique, okay? In the 1960s, French philosopher Guy Debord argued in The Society of the Spectacle that social life had been replaced by a representation of it, that the commodification of social interactions had led to the production of intoxicating spectacles that undermined and weakened the meaningful connections people had between one another. It was, quote, the decline of being into having and having into merely appearing. Two decades later, Jean Baudrillard, and I know I'm going heavy on the French philosophers here, continued this idea, saying that we currently exist in a state of hyper-reality, in which commodification has reached an extreme in which the things that are being represented, signified, and consumed have no original source or referent. It's what Umberto Eco calls the authentic fake. In this new reality, where brands signify social and economic status, they are what is being consumed, rather than the content or the physical goods that they represent. When we talk about music, we talk about authenticity, originality, sincerity. And according to Baudrillard, there is no longer any such thing. Baudrillard's work drew heavily on another 1960s philosopher named Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan famously argued that the medium is the message meaning that the technologies that convey content, rather than the content itself, are what shapes human interactions. An assembly line, for instance, redefines social hierarchies. In the case of the NAMM show, especially for the attendees with deep pockets to buy audiovisual equipment, the look of the stage itself and how the stage sounded were just as important as who was on stage and how they sounded. The vehicle for the performance was the performance. Okay, 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 okay. Is this exactly what's going on with concerts? No, absolutely not. Was I, along with everyone else, hella stoked to see Earth, Wind, and Fire play? Of course I was. Was it even better because of the high production value? Yes. I mean, just look at that stage. That stage is fucking dope. Look at it. Look at it. I like stuff, okay? You're still gonna read me in the comments, aren't you? I can feel it coming. Please be nice to me. What I am saying is that even in a performance context where sound is believed to be the primary object of our attention, the concert, the medium of the concert stage, is still predominantly visual. And yes, I'm shoehorning my topic of music into a larger philosophical argument about art and politics and ideology and technology, and it misses out on a lot of the finer nuance points that these philosophers were making. But we have the opportunity to be intentional about where we direct attention and how we direct attention and what the goal of directing attention is. And I want people to look at my guitar and think, wow, that's a cool guitar. She must be cool. And in the spirit of that, I'm going to rock these blue strings on this sparkle caster and launch it into space now. Bye. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. I've been wanting to try vlogging for a minute now, and it seems as good a time as any to start, so hello, everybody. This is going to be a bit of an experiment. I want to make some videos that have some value and give you something to think about. And I also need to do something with this fancy degree. So if there's something you'd like to know more about, ask me. And if you like these, drop me a comment and maybe I'll make more of them. Um, also, help me think of a better name for this thing. I really need your help with that.